good day to all of you. Very welcome to the session. My name is Nadine Sander. I'm the policy officer, policy officer of the Water and Development Partnership Program, and I am the master of ceremony for uh, this session. We just had a very interesting and fruitful first session, and we look very much forward to the upcoming presentations and the discussions. I have some housekeeping rules here for you. Mm, you can use the chat during the presentation to express yourself and share insights. However, if you have questions for the speakers, please place them in the Q&A mentioning the name of the speaker. Uh, you can find this Q&A in the toolbar uh, below in your window. Also, a request to the panelists, to the pre to the presenters, that uh, you can also ask um, access this Q and A, and then you can already answer some of the questions that um, you um, well, you find relevant to answer. After the presentations are over, we will reuse the remaining time uh, for discussion. During this period, you can also raise the hands. Um, we might give you the mic, depends a little bit on how the flow goes. Um, and please also for the speakers, if you are speaking, turn on your camera. And a note is that this presentation will be recorded and we will also share the recordings with the attendees after the symposium has ended. Then, I'm going to introduce the moderator of this uh, session, Technology for Impact. Uh, the moderator of the session is Professor Graham Hewitt. Jewett. He is Professor Hydrology at IG Delft Institute for Water Education since 2019. Um, yes, Graham, I see you're here with your camera on. Um, prior to this, he was the director of the Center for Water Resources Research and um, Jeannie, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Water Chair of Water Resources Research at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. His recent work has been focused on the effective use of science to better inform land and water resources policy development, especially in developing countries and developing tools to support the effective implementation of these. Graham, can I give you the mic? Thanks, Nadine, for the introduction. Yes, uh, I think you should be able to hear me now. All good, I hope. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. If You're it is good, good afternoon for you. Um, very nice to see so many people joining this uh, interesting session. Nadine introduced me. My name is Graham Jewett. I also just want to introduce our rapporteur, uh, Fariana Rashid, who has uh, already typed in the chat. I don't know if you want to show us your face, uh, Fariana, so we can actually uh, recognize you because you will also have a short feedback session at the end of, um, end of the day. The session, I think, is a very interesting one, Technology for Impact. And, um, well, let's think about that a bit. There are lots and lots of technology solutions, of course, but um, they can be inclusive or they can be exclusive. There are many issues associated with technology around access, cost, technical cap capacity to engage with them. And today we have three very interesting speakers and three different topics where we will learn a little bit more about um, effective technology for impact. So that certainly is the challenge for the three speakers that we have. Um, let me introduce the speakers very briefly because um, they will uh, soon be taking over. First, we have Marlous Moll from IHE Delft. Uh, Marlous is the Associate Professor of Water Resources Management uh, here. And she's focusing at the moment um, on work related to water accounting and water productivity. And there's a very strong team that she leads working in that. I see Marlous is the only one with the camera on, so I think it's probably better that I don't introduce all three speakers right now. I'll introduce the others just before their presentations. 
So I think uh, let me hand over to Marluz for her presentation. And um, just remember those rules and suggestions that Nadine um, uh, posed that uh, please use the Q&A and be quite specific about who the question you are asking is for. And the panelists can then respond to those. So Marluz, uh, over to you. Thank you, Graham. And you can see my screen? I can see your screen very clearly and I can hear you well. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, great to be here. It's a very interesting um, symposium and also an interesting topic about technology for impact. Uh, and today I want to talk a little bit about this project that we've been implementing over the last uh, well, five or so years uh, that is called Water Productivity Improvement. Um, uh, productivity Improve. No, what was it? Water Productivity uh, Improving. No, what are I don't remember what the title is. Anyway, I'll come up with it. So it's Waterpip project, and I would like to talk a little bit about the previous phases on um, what we've done so far on uh, technology for impact and what the way forward is. So we recently started uh, a next phase of the project, and we're really looking into uh, yeah, extending our knowledge and our experience of the first two phases. Um, so what were these different um, phases about? So we started in 2018 with the first phase where we were um, yeah, advised by the, the Dutch government to uh, develop a guidance on uh, water, productivity improve, uh, water productivity concepts and to uh, support this um, objective of improving water productivity improvement in practice. Water, that was the uh, abbreviation, in the agricultural sector using the vapor database. So it's a new data product uh, based on remote sensing data. Uh, and can we use that to inform a decision making on improving water productivity? And in the first phase, we really tested more uh, the vapor data and how we could actually utilize that data for agricultural applications. So it's really focused on developing these uh, applications using the, um, the remote sensing data. And based on that, uh, so we did a lot of testing, a lot of validation of the data. We developed protocols for vapor analysis, diagnostics, what is causing uh, vapor or water productivity variations, and also um, yeah, providing a compendium on uh, identifying solutions for improving water productivity. In the second phase, we started also um, sharing our knowledge and our skills and our um, and our yeah our developed uh, protocols. Uh, by developing training of trainers. And we started in three different countries. We identified uh, centers uh, and uh, knowledge hubs where we engage with uh, and uh, we identified local uh, expertise uh, and we trained them in using the, uh, the tools that we had developed. And we also developed an online course with uh, a lot of the information that we had developed. And this year we started this uh, an, an extension to those two projects um, and that's on a, a knowledge action network. So we're really uh, consolidating the um, materials that we developed and developing with more partners locally in the countries uh, and utilizing this data and also trying to make sure that whatever we develop really reaches the audience and develops the, um, and, and really addresses the challenges that people are facing on the ground. Uh, and we also try to combine local knowledge, local data together with the remote sensing images. And I'll explain a little bit, a bit, a bit, a little bit later on why we focused on uh, also local data. So these are the three different steps that we uh, developed. So we had uh, all kinds of tools developed and scripts and technical uh, analysis uh, using the vapor data to actually map out water productivity variations, irrigation performance assessment using this remote data, uh, the remote data, remote sensing data. And we developed all these uh, standardized protocols on how to systematically do those analysis. So we, it's a scan on identifying what is where and how uh, are the performance uh, variations. We also developed different methodologies on how to identify what's causing some of these variations. And that uh, we identified we could do field surveys, we could apply other remote sensing data to see if the variation were caused, uh, could be identified um, through other remote sensing data products and also aquacrop modeling. So very high uh, yeah, modeling in uh, the fields, um, but we can only do one field at a time, whereas remote sensing data, we can actually do an, a scan across the field in one go. 
And we also developed uh, a document and a tool um, that had uh, a lot of interventions that could actually address some of these uh, low water productivity uh, identified areas and see if there, you know, what is causing it and how can we address this. So this is one of the examples and the case studies that we developed with partners in, uh, in Kenya. So the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture uh, was one of our partners and they identified um, um, center pivot irrigation system in uh, the, uh, the, the Tana River Basin where they were growing wheat. Um, and they were interested in doing vapor analysis in this particular area. So here you see already some analysis that were done. So we they identified the amount of water consumed in the different center pivots. And you already see that there's quite some variations uh, in the uh, water consumption in the center pivots. We also see that the similar variation was there in the crop yield. So you could actually think about what is causing you know, low water productivity in some of these areas. Uh, and of course, also the water productivity could be assessed. So the idea was really to find out, you know, are there uh, opportunities also to save water, to improve the water yields in these particular areas? So we engaged with the local uh, irrigation manager uh, to see, you know, is some of this information from the remote sensing data, is it of interest and could he, um, uh, yeah, could he utilize it to improve his water management in the system? So in addition to the remote sensing, they also installed a number of soil moisture sensors and they tested in the, in the season 2022 and 2023. And we trained or they trained the, the scheme stuff in the, the irrigation scheme. And actually, as a result of that, they realized they were over irrigating the, um, the uh, center pivots and they went from um, daily uh, irrigation to only irrigating three to four days and they reduced the number of uh, or the num amount of water that they applied without an impact on the production. So you could already see that a lot of this information could really help reducing uh, the water application and therefore also for instance pumping costs etc. So this is some of uh, an example of what we've done with the tools and we applied it in a case study in Kenya. Uh, what we did realize that uh, this remote sensing data was not applicable for all kinds of applications. So it provides a lot of inf relevant information to support agriculture water management, but also the resolution. Yeah? So a pixel could be uh, 250 meter by 250 meter. That's relevant maybe for a large scale irrigation scheme, but maybe not for uh, small scale farmers. So uh, we found that a lot of the success of the vapor applications were in large scale monoculture uh, monocrop culture irrigation schemes. Um, but we also realized that to really understand the analysis, we need to have um, an understanding from what's happening on the ground and have uh, field observations and understanding of crop seasons, crop types, et cetera. And we also needed to be much better integrated on what's happening on the ground, what are the needs to make these applications relevant, which you know we tried out with this large irrigation scheme in uh, Kenya. So in the current phase, we're much more focusing towards um, yeah, the marginalized communities and finding um, yeah, what, how can we uh, utilize some of this remote sensing, this valuable information also for communities that are uh, marginalized. So these are some of the, the steps that we are planning. So the project is starting, that we're planning to uh, start up. So we want to first see who are these marginalized farmers. So we're working with our uh, new partners in identifying and co-creating what are the criteria for identifying the marginalized farmers. And that is all kinds of combination of social and economic uh, indicators. And we want to have uh, project level indicators that across the project um, are the same. And we want to have a uh, local indicators. So on each side, there are of course specific uh, indicators that are relevant. We also want to Based on that, after we've identified them, we want to see what level of uh, technology use and applications uh, do they have. Uh, and we want to see what kind of specific needs of data do they have uh, from you know, water related data in addition to uh, what we could get from remote sensing. Then we identify some plots where we want to do some experiments and we develop these above based tools with the, with the assessment that we've done. So this is a general overview of the type of analysis that we want to do. So we want to have uh, an iterative cycle of, you know, engaging with the communities, developing applications, and then continuing developing uh, the uh, yeah the applications, testing, uh, and we continue doing until 
uh, the communities are finding the tools that we develop relevant and they want to take up this um, yeah, these applications that we've developed, the combination of digital tools and remote sensing analysis. So that is um, what we're planning to do. So there's a lot of things that we still want to do, and we want to really take the uh, the data, remote sensing data, really to the ground, um, and we want to really uh, investigate, you know, how can we utilize both remote sensing data and, and the, the local data to make relevant applications that are relevant for these marginalized farmers. So you can see more on our website where you can find all the information about what we've done in the first phases. And of course, we'll be updating it with the new new phase outputs and what we're um, yeah, what we're starting up soon. Thank you. Thank you, Marluz. Um, so I see they are just looking at the QA. They are two questions uh, which we can address while we do the changeover. And the first one I don't think is relevant to your question, but um, your presentation. The first one is how much water is needed, is irrigated on one hectare per day? That's a bit of a general question. So perhaps you can give a general answer about how you assess that. Yeah, so we're well. How much is needed, of course, has got to do with the type of crop that is in the field, uh, and I don't think about it as number of you know how much water per hectare, but I'm thinking about the water depth. So we have you know uh, a crop like maize, you've got 600 millimeters uh, per season. You've got a crop like uh, sugarcane that grows the whole year and is very intensive crop uh, that uses more than a thousand millimeters uh, over a season. So it's really crop dependent. Uh, and then we need to think about how much they're actually using. So how we estimate the actual water consumption is using uh, these products of the actual evapotranspiration products that uh, Vapor is providing. And then of course, we also do a comparison what was the crop expecting to uh, grow optimally and how much was it getting? So we can also get an estimate of, is there a reduction in yield due to um, uh, water stress conditions? Okay, and then the second question, um, which I think is quite an interesting one, uh, did the farmers running the scheme participate in the remote sensing? And what is the plan to engage them further in the next phase? And while we're doing that, I think we can um, start uh, sharing the presentation of the next speaker. Uh, yes, yeah, so the um, uh, actually the area that we were uh, engaging with is um, an irrigation scheme that's managed. Uh, so it's not small the farmers that are partition or that's part and partial of the irrigation scheme. We actually have uh, a, a management body that manages the irrigation scheme. So we were engaging with the farm operators, the farm managers and the farm, uh, yeah, the, the, the people that are running the farm, but they're not like individual farmers that are responsible for a field. Um, so we're actually with the water pit project, we're not continuing at this scale because we're focusing much more on the marginalized communities. Uh, but with the, the original vapor project, we're actually engaging with the um, National Irrigation Authority. So that was the organization that was managing this irrigation scheme. And we're continuing doing these analysis with them. And not only about on this irrigation scheme, but we're also scaling it out on the other irrigation schemes uh, that they're managing. Okay. Well, thank you, Marluz. I think you have to stop sharing for the next person to start sharing. So I just did. Okay, great. All right, so uh, before I introduce the next speaker, um, I see that Fariana has joined us. Fariana, do you just want to quickly say hello to everyone now that you are vis uh, yeah. video and audible capable? Yeah, I'm not, am I audible? No? Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Good, all right, nice to have you join us now. Um, there are a number of uh, questions in the Q&A, which Marluz, uh, you can respond to directly um, while we have our next presentation. And that uh, presenter is Violet Maturu, who is from the Millennium Community Development Initiative in Kenya. Uh, Violet is the executive director and co-founder of the uh, MCDI, as, she, as the Millennium Community Development Initiatives are called. And she's also an independent consultant in monitoring and evaluation, natural resources management, and gender and social inclusion. 
Violet, a uh, warm welcome to you. We look forward to your presentation. And maybe just one thing to note is that because this is being translated, the translators need to be able to keep up with you. So um, it helps if uh, you, you slow down a bit. I, of course, I, I don't know what your normal presentation style is, but I'm sure it will be suitable. So over to you, Violet. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So let me just get my stop clock starting. Okay, so yeah, so I am, I'm going to present on an upcoming project, which is called Remote Sensing for Basin Scale and Local Community Driven, driven Applications from Water Accounting Plus to Colani. So this, this project has the partners of IG Delft, our community-based organization called MCDI, the Professor Wangari Mazai Institute of the University of Nairobi, the Wildlife Research and Training Institute in Kenya, and Pani.Earth is an organization in India, and then our long-term partners, both ends in the Netherlands. So a very quick con context uh, setting. So when you look at Kenya, this, this project will be in Kenya. So Kenya is a country that's the, the area, 582,000 kilometers squared. Compared to Netherlands, you can see it's a moderately large country, but not too large. We have a population of 40 million, and 80% of the country is arid and semi-arid. And the longest river is the Tana River, which you can see. And the second longest river is the Athi River. And these two rivers are affected by the capital city of Nairobi, where 95% of the water that is used in the city is done by interbasin transfer from the Tana River. And then we in the city pollute it and dump it into the Athi River. So the city essentially destroys two watersheds. So the Athi River Community Network is, we formed this as people who live along the Athi River, just as people are concerned and who see ourselves as both the problem and the solution. So we just, we, we collaborate among ourselves and we focus on especially bringing together water resource users associations. These are legally recognized by government under the Water Act. And we, we, we network the different RUAs, as we call them. We share information, we share opportunities, we share challenges. Even right now in the, in the, in, in the symposium, two of my colleagues are there. One is in the middle section, Makweni, Halinishi Yusuf, and where they have a big problem with sand river harvesting. Then we also have Violet, who comes from the upstream of the, of the basin. So today I'm going to use the case of upstream in this region called the Fadi, where the Fadi Rua is located. And the case study I'm going to use is Larry Swamp. The Larry Swamp and the Roiro Dam, they are like a microcosm of the challenges that face the Athi River along the basin and also other basins. So Larry Swamp, you will see this. It looks like grassland, but it's actually a swamp. So there's lots of water underground. It's about 600 acres and it is under immense pressure. The swamp supplies the Roiro River and the Roiro Dam. So the second picture is of the Roiro Dam that was, uh, it was constructed before Kenya got independence in the 1950s, specifically to supply water to the European settlers in the city of Nairobi. It basically bypasses everybody as that water is piped to Nairobi. There is a proposed second dam along the same river, which is the Roiro II Dam, and it's going to be financed by the Deutsche Bank. It has hit some snags with the con contracting. The tender has right now been ca uh, cancelled, but it, ha it raises a lot of issues. The swamp also has a lot of social social issues, even historical issues like the Larry massacre, which occurred where the communities now have a very negative view about the swamp and try to, they try to dry it up 
by pushing soil so that they can grow crops. So the, the, the swamp is under a lot of pressure and yet very little is known about the swamp's hydrology, the volumes of water that are being obstructed, whether that is at a sustainable level. So the, the, the need for scientific data is very critical, especially now the government has recognized it. The Larry Swamp as an important grind, groundwater storage area, but there is very little limited scientific information about the swamp and the rivers it supplies downstream. So the question I was asked to address was how can remote sensing experts make maps useful for communities? Looking using that Larry Swamp as an example, we would really need as communities maps that seek to inform, especially about the hydrology. A lot of these swamps in our country, people don't understand how much water do they hold, how deep are they, what are they supplied, which rivers, subterranean or otherwise, are supplying these swamps with water and how much water is leaving the swamp, how much is being obstructed, those kinds of things. Then also, how people are connected among themselves. You've seen our very simple map, but that map is so good at getting people to understand how they are interconnected. So if you live downstream of me, and I know you by name, my actions tend to be influenced by the fact that I know that when I do something, it will have a negative effect on you because I know you as Graham or Mutuko downstream. So that kind of interconnection, those kinds of maps can really help, especially for advocacy for the conservation of critical water resources. Maps should also inspire. They should show the effects of you know, protection, restoration, like before and after maps. They should also alarm, like for example, the second dam that is planned along this same river, there are people who are saying that the, the second dam will essentially drain the first dam. So having that kind of knowledge scientifically proven, shown that this is, this is going to be the effect, can really help even in the advocacy. Instead of creating this second dam, then it's a mess. As has happened with another dam that was constructed in Kenya, still in the Athid Basin, that was designed for drinking water, and yet it was found that the waters are highly polluted, that right now the government is in a state of flux, wondering what to do with this dam that's not being completed, but the water cannot be used for its intended purpose. purpose. So with regards to a, a data, they, there's need to involve communities in defining not just the problems, but also the solutions, and you can use maps to vision futures. So, how remote sensing can ensure how these projects will ensure that collaboration of communities in technology in technology use is by the use of citizen science and making research very interactive having joint learning and then involving communities in setting the research agenda so we also need to demystify technology and we need to work with local experts and they are there so that they can be part part and parcel of understanding how they can study and understand these water, water bodies and how to communicate that information to the communities, especially in local language and in vision, visioning how they can then improve these problems. So we also need to enhance institutional capacities, for example, of the rulers to collect, store and use data. So CBOs like ours, can use remote sensing to increase government accountability. And then governments need communities so that they can understand these ecosystems. And then they also need the communities so that they can define the, the solutions together with the communities. And remote sensing can facilitate that kind of mutual learning. Remote sensing and community knowledge can be powerful tools to promote accountability of both. Neither, uh, neither is a saint or a devil. I think it, it's a bit of both. So everybody needs to also be held accountable, including communities, including governments. So remote sensing can facilitate discussions of historical and contextual issues, some of which are very sensitive. 
and the comparison of historical and cur current remote sensing data can show the success or the failure of the government approaches to conserving basins. So that is us, members of the Athi River Community Network. We welcome all of you to help us. We are ready to host anybody with technical knowledge. We listened to, I think, Florence, the kind of data she's collecting, and would welcome even tips on the equipment to use and how to go about collecting this data to make it relevant and to make it address actual issues and problems that we are currently facing in the acid basin. Thank you very much. Pilot, thank you very much. Um, I think your presentation is going to stimulate quite a lot of discussion at the end of the day today, um, particularly your suggestion around the use of citizen science as a link into remote sensing. So I look forward to the discussion about that uh, a little bit later. Um, if you will stop sharing, we can do the transition uh, to clear our next speaker. Meanwhile, I do see um, uh, the question is for Marluz. Okay, so no questions for Violet at this stage, but I'm sure we will, uh, people will pick those up uh, shortly. And uh, I know that I already have a couple of questions for the session at the end of the um, of the presentation, the open Q&A session. Okay, so in that case, let's move on to our third speaker. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce my colleague from IHE Delft, Claire Furlong. Claire is a co-lead and deputy lead of the Risk Wash Project, and she is a senior lecturer and researcher in sanitation here at IHE Delft. She's got a lot of experience in the wash, um, uh, what we call washer sector. No, I don't think we call it a sector, just in wash. And um, she has done a lot of work in humanitarian and development context. So Claire, we look forward to hearing from you. And we can't hear you. But you are not mute. Oh, you are muted. That's can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Oh, excellent. I have to apologize for my voice because I'm a bit sick at the moment. So what I want to do is I'm going to take you from the world of remote sensing to um, sanitation in refugee camps. But um, my project is more about the process rather than the technology, because we're right at the start of this project. So I'm looking at embedding our work in the humanitarian sector uh, in this presentation. And what you can see in the first slide is all of the logo logos from our partners and sounding board. And I'll talk a bit about them later, so I won't introduce them now. My oh, slide seems stuck. Okay, there we are. So the objectives of this presentation is to reflect upon the co-creation of the Risk Wash project, to discuss why embedding research is essential in humanitarian contexts, and to reflect upon how we hope this will lead to impact. So this project or this presentation is much more about the process rather than the project, but if you have questions about the project, I'll be happy to answer them later. So before we go into this, you need to know a bit about um, the aim of our project. And what we're looking at is we're looking at trying to quantify health risks from different transmission pathways associated with fecal sludge management. So when I use the term fecal sludge management throughout this presentation, just think of sanitation. And we're looking at sanitation in humanitarian contexts. Um, and especially within camps, that's the context that we're looking at. So in uh, Risk Wash, what we're trying to do is we're trying to adapt decision making tools that have been developed for the development sector for the, uh, we're going to adapt them from the humanitarian context, um, hopefully to improve public health outcomes. So what we're really trying to do here is provide information for evidence based decision making within the humanitarian context. 
So to reflect upon the co-creation, I need to describe how the project was developed. So it started in 2020 with a call from ELRA. And this was for research in a humanitarian crisis with a specific focus on public health research. Um, when we looked at this call, we also reviewed, there was a gap analysis from the sector and we reviewed this and we came up with the idea of looking at uh, fecal sludge management or sanitation because there was a lack of attention on sanitation in this sector. And because we use this gap analysis to inform our proposal, our proposal was very demand driven. So we was very much trying to fill a gap that the sector itself had highlighted. So we formed our initial consortium um, that was IHE Delft in the Netherlands, um, University of North Carolina in the USA, ICDDRB in Bangladesh. And we also incorporated or we worked with uh, the FSM Twig. Now, the FSM Twig, this is the Fecal Sludge Management Technical Working Group. And this is a global advisory on humanitarian sanitation. And it also has pathways into national and local wash clusters. And that's how wash is managed in the humanitarian sector. We was also working with the Netherlands Red Cross. So we co-created the proposal based with the FSM Twig and uh, the Netherlands Red Cross, who are from the humanitarian sector, and they have multiple actors from that sector in those um, organisations. Sorry. So um, I see DDRB are from Bangladesh and they have a vast amount of experience in doing undertaking research in Cox's Bazaar. And that's where we hope to do this research. And you may have heard of Cox's Bazaar because it's the largest refugee camp in the world. The reason that we chose this area was that um, it has a high diversity of different sanitation systems and strategies there. And our proposal at this time was focused on the effectiveness and the impact of sanitation on the public health of the communities within the refugee camp. Now, sadly, this proposal was unsuccessful, but during this process, we've, we received a lot of feedback from the sector itself because they reviewed the, uh, the proposal and we was able to write a rebuttal. Now, in the review of the proposal, um, they really wanted quantifiable health outcomes. So they was really looking for randomised controlled trials, which is kind of the gold standard of uh, studies undertaken in the public health sector. And we wasn't going to do that, and we never was. They also questioned how we'd embedded our research within the humanitarian sector. And this was mainly due to... Um, I suppose a lack of clarity about the flow of knowledge and information from the research to the humanitarian community itself. So was this uh, initial proposal embedded in the humanitarian sector? Well, it was demand driven. We had worked from a document and from a gap in knowledge that the sector had identified itself. We had involved and been involved and co-developed the proposal with the humanitarian sector, and that was with the FSM Twig and with the Netherlands Red Cross. But this could be seen as being a much higher level, maybe a global level more than a local level. We lacked local partners and we lacked clarity on how we would manage the knowledge flows to and from the, the project itself and the humanitarian sector. And we lacked um, local academic partners. So we could say that it's not really embedded or not clearly embedded in the uh, humanitarian sector at this point. Then came another opportunity in 2002 when there was the call for the DUPC3 um, large scale proposals. What we did then was we reactivated our network and you can see um, our initial network are those institutes that are highlighted in black or have black font. 
And then what we did was we um, identified new partners through our networks and our previous collaboration. An example of that is BRAC. So we'd IHE and we'd worked um, as IHE, we'd worked with BRAC in the past. We'd done training on humanitarian sanitation with them in Cox's Bazaar. We also expanded to another country. This was suggested by the uh, Netherlands Red Cross. So we expanded to cover um, in Repi in Uganda, and then we brought in the um, Ugandan Red Cross. And once we had our consortium uh, together, we, we co-created and reframed the proposal around the concept of risk and, um, uh, and risk management. And this creation and co-creation of the proposal was done both um, at the proposal writing stage and at the inception stage. So is the proposal embedded now within the humanitarian sector? We would probably say it's more embedded now because it's embedded both at the local level with um, local NGOs that are managing the uh, faecal sludge treatment plants. Those are the plants that are treating the waste um, within those camps. And also at a global level through the FSM Twig and the Netherlands Red Cross. So why is embedding research essential? So it's essential when you're working in humanitarian, in the humanitarian sector, because the sector itself um, is involved with the governance of the camp settings, and that's very different to um, general governance. They uh, control the access to the camps. They're also um, safeguard, sorry about this, gave, safeguard the uh, community's safety. And they also, um, there's also a high standard for ethics related to research in camp settings that they also oversee. So I would say it's almost impossible not to, to do research within humanitarian camp settings without embedding your research in the humanitarian sector. So why do we think this will improve impact? Well, our research is demand driven. So it comes from a problem that's been stated by the sector. So we're investigating that. And we're on this journey together. We've got an ongoing collaboration um, at global, national and local level. So we're in constant consultation with the different um, organizations from the FSM Twig to um, the local clusters. An example of this is when we were, when we selected the fecal sludge treatment plants that we want to, um, that we want to use in our study. We did that through a series of collaborations both at national and local level. Um, another example of this is that we're building local humanitarian capacity in the tools that we're, we're going to be using. So we're doing training sessions next year. And this goes beyond the members of our consortium to the wider humanitarian sector. So this was just, uh, this is the final slide, which is about just ongoing collaboration. So we're always checking the relevance of our work by working closely with the FSM Twig and the local WASH clusters and through other activities like participating in the Emergency Environmental Health Forum. And this is, uh, oh, this is our stories. Uh, this is the story of our project so far. Thank you for listening. And um, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions about the process or the project itself. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, the, the, I think there are two questions in the chat. I haven't quite had, uh, uh, I saw one that uh, was quite specific. Um, can, if you just go back your two slides, please, I had a quick question I wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think the next one. Oh, anyway, you, you said something about the tools that you would be using. Mm -hmm. What are those tools? Can you just explain that briefly? Oh, excellent question. <laughs> so these are tools that have been used in the development uh, in the development context to assess risk 
um, at different stages of what we would call the sanitation value chain. So we'll be using um, three different tools. One of them is a SaniPath tool, which looks at uh, risk. Um, it looks at visualizing the amount of risk there is in different um, different transmission through different transmission pathways for different groups of people. Um, there is the sanitation safety uh, planning tool, um, which looks at risk at different stages of fecal sludge treatment. So at the treatment process, and then you do a you can do different kinds of risk assessments. Uh, with that, and then we're looking at QMRA um, and also looking at screening of the fecal sludge for pathogens. So there are a number of different tools related to risk assessment that we will be adapting for the humanitarian context. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. I, I, I was interested in what those tools were. So it's mainly to do with risk assessments. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what we do now is we move on to a general uh, a Q&A session, but uh, there are a couple of questions I'd like to ask the presenters to give us a bit of a, a sort of see if we can pull some of these things together a little bit. Meanwhile, there are a number of questions in the Q&A addressed to um, the three of you. Violet, are you still with us? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Ah. Okay, so um, I think it's been an interesting session. Remember, our, 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 our session is about technology for impact. And we've heard from Marluce and Violet about remote sensing as a technology. And from Claire, I think more a bit about some of the more the tools that they use for risk-based assessment. But it struck me that in all of them, there was something around uh, a way in which that quite technical information is um, interpreted or transferred to a different audience from those that develop it. Uh, Claire mentioned visualization. Uh, Marlous mentioned um, a sort of role of some intermediaries. It wasn't the farmers that used the remote sensing directly. There was some intermediary. And Violet mentioned uh, citizen science. So I just invite uh, the three of you to sort of comment on the importance of how this sort of technical information is translated to its intended user, if the intended user is not the technical expert who developed it. Who can I ask to kick off? Could I? Yeah, clear. Oh, sorry. Um, I was going to say what's of interest to us is we're looking at developing um, or adapting the tools, and each of the tools has a visual component. So it's very different, the development of the tool and the user of the tool and who's going to be using the output of the tool. So... We're looking at doing a, looking at having a very, um, like having infographics that are very simple. So a lot of the tools have these very simple infographics that can then be interpreted quite easily by the users. And we've got quite a bit of experience in tool development, but what one of the um, parts of this actual project is also to look at how useful the tools are um, within themselves once they've been developed so looking at who the users would be and um, discussing with them if these are actually usable for them and it's something that they're willing to do. And also looking at those that will be using the outputs from the tools for decision making to see whether that would be it's going to be clear for them, because this is you know, probably the first stage of the project and the development of the tools that we're looking at adapting for the humanitarian sector. I don't know if that's answered your question. I think I've just well, yeah, described I, our process. I think it does, because I okay. think you know that importance of those infographics, those sort of intermediary products is obviously uh, very important and, and the development of them and how they are then interpreted or 
perceived and received is an important aspect of the work, which I, it sounds like you will be covering. So maybe if I can move to Violet then, because Violet is that simple map which you highlighted as being so important, a form of an infographic, and how would you build more on that? Yeah, for, for me, I think the problem even starts with who defines the research? I started my professional career as a researcher with the Kenya Wildlife Service, and even the research agenda was defined from outside. So right from the beginning, there was a lot of keenness to count the number of elephants. And that was a research agenda that when we would then go and find out their problems with human wildlife conflict, it doesn't matter that there are 20 elephants in this forest, when they come and destroy your crop, you 20 or 21 or 22, that may not be your most important issue. It might be more important to understand the, the, the migratory patterns, ways to, you know, the research agenda itself, the definition of that has in most times come from academics. You see a lot of research on water bodies, PhD, masters, online. And many times those are people not from the community. So I may come from a, a, a place near Nairobi, but I go to a place in a very different way at the coast and do research there. So there is already a disconnect because the people themselves had, are not the ones defining their research issues. Like for example, in Kenya, we have a very big problem with water quality because of the high fluoride levels. But a lot of these uh, boreholes are being uh, drilled and they are supplying water with a lot of fluoride at a high level, yet it's very difficult to get water quality testing for fluoride as a citizen. So what we and in our project would like to do, we'd like to make science more accessible to us as citizens so that the scientists can then come listen to our problems and help us define tools, help us like now we are looking for what is the good equipment to do water quality testing? What is the more affordable equipment? If I had money, what should I buy? So we want scientists to now respond to us and our needs. And then we together co-create the research. And that way, even the dissemination will become much easier because we'll have understood it right from the beginning. So I think that's, I don't know whether it goes around the issue, but that's that's how I would see it. Well, what I understand you know, in the context of this session, which is technology for impact, you see it as part of that broader discussion about framing the research and the tools that will be used. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Marluz, do you want to respond to that on this, this issue of uh, interpreters or intermediaries between the data and, and the various levels of user. Yeah, no, definitely. Because, I mean, that's one of the things that we were struggling with in the first couple of phases, because we also needed from our understanding, you know, from our perspective, understand what the data could tell us. Um, but we also didn't have enough information on what was needed on the ground. So there was a bit of a, you know, trying to figure out um, where to go, what kind of uh, focus to uh, to put on, you know, the data analysis, because of course, us as scientists are very interested in seeing what the data can tell us and do more analysis and more validation, etc. But that's not the type of information that somebody needs on the ground. And actually, especially during the COVID um, period, um, we, we, have, we had in the first phase also a plan to go into the field, to talk to farmers, you know, what kind of information do they need? And we weren't you know, it wasn't possible for us to go to the field. And we actually utilized some of these local centers uh, and we trained them and they could go to the field. And I actually think even now, you know, we are able to go into the field, but does it really make sense for us to go once every so many months? And then, you know, we pop up and we have a discussion um, to really understand what's going on, what kind of information do these uh, people in the field need and actually we should utilize much more people on the ground experts on the ground 
to make that translation and we support them from our end. We're not the ones driving, you know, what comes out of the analysis and what the tool should look like. No, they should drive it and we support them with, you know, technical issues or something like that. But it should come really from the field through the intermediates and then we're there, you know, just to provide the technical and, and support rather than the other way around. When we develop something, we say, okay, you need to uh, do an irrigation performance assessment and this is what the analysis will tell you. So I think that connection is very important. Okay, thanks, Marluz. So perhaps um, moving on to one of those ways of making connections, Violet and Claire, well, Violet mentioned citizen science. Claire's brief description of the project did mention citizen science, but you didn't in the um, presentation. Uh, oh, Claire? Claire seemed to have disappeared. Oh, she's back. Um, and perhaps, Marlous, you have some experience of that. And I know it's a topic that people are quite interested in. So perhaps um, I'd like to invite uh, uh, the three of you to just reflect on the role of citizen science as in this world of technology for impact or in this theme of technology for impact. Violet, shall I ask you to kick off? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think uh, since I've been now researching on citizen science, I think in the past, the divide between scientists and citizens was much broader. And then there was the element that scientists, and I'm as guilty as you know the rest of the other scientists. I did start off my career as a scientist. Scientists tend to, tended to look at citizens, even if they observed something, unless the scientists came and did some control where, you know, they, 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 they set up an experiment and then they would not believe what the citizens were saying unless they came in and did their own controlled experiments on an issue. Now, in, in, since then, citizens have come up and they're now playing a very big role like in because i started off as a zoologist they're playing a very big role even in uh, like on i naturalist you know, there's apps where you contribute to take out a certain species of a plant or whatever you upload it you you're part of the identification of it you are you are contributing to the body of knowledge and there are now many apps coming up and there's a much more interest now in citizen science, like um, I googled and found a, 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 a company in the Netherlands called Drinkable Rivers, and it's two young ladies who started this this company, and they're they are, they are, they are providing kits. You buy a kit that you can measure E. coli, and then you can do the 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 water turbidity. You can measure those things as a citizen. So we purchased one such kit. And even just by sharing information about we are testing water quality on Facebook, people are interested. They're like, I've been suspecting my water quality is not all that. Can I send you samples? So citizen science has now grown. And now I think scientists are catching up because citizens are saying, I, it's me drinking this water. I want to know what's in this water. So they're taking steps to actually start finding out how do I test the quality of the water I'm drinking? So the scientists now have also realized that this is an opportunity. So I think that gap is closing and that's a good thing because science is exciting and it should be accessible to more people. It shouldn't be up there. It should be, the children should be taught how to you know, engage in science, even if that's not their career path, but as part of citizens. Yeah, okay, thank you. And of course, some of those apps are, are a really good example of, of technological development. And by the way, um, of mention of Drinkable Rivers, Leanne, who is one of the founder members, was our uh, guest speaker at graduation last year, I think. Um, Claire, do you want to comment on, on citizen science, particularly perhaps in the context of, of uh, humanitarian and camps? Yeah, I mean, I think within the context of this project, I don't think we've used the term citizen science and we've gone away from that and we've used like, I've got more of a foundation in the development sector. So we look at participation. Um, 
And because our project is co-developed by the sector itself and embedded, we're looking at how we can be as participatory as possible in the development and adaptation of the tools. And the tools themselves, some of them are very participatory. So the, if anybody's familiar with sanitation safety planning or water safety planning, actually normally the risk assessments are done with the people that actually work at the plants and involve them quite actively. Um, and that's what we're, we're hoping to continue this on, this kind of participatory approach when we adapt these tools. And then when we talk about the people that are working at the plants, they're actually members of the communities themselves. So they come from the camp communities. So there is involvement there. Um, and we're also looking at incorporating lots of participatory methods when we're looking at developing and adapting the tool. So um, having the refugee community involved um, uh, in that process, but we're not really using citizen science within this project, I think, as Violet has framed it. Okay. But the participation um, mm -hmm. is, is yes. absolutely critical as well. Yeah, you're... participation, co-creation, um, and also have, and people having ownerships of the processes. Yeah. So Marluce, maybe on to you. I mean, we, we hear a lot about citizen science as a way of um, doing validation for remote sensing or other technologies, but I think there might be more to it than that. And certainly, um, and also um, maybe not focusing necessarily on the term of citizen science, perhaps like Claire mentioned, uh, using more participatory approaches, but perhaps you can comment on that in the context of water PIP. Yeah, no, exactly. So, I mean, we're we're trying to, okay, we're interested, you know, from a scientific point of view in, in validating remote sensing data, um, but uh, the whole idea of having the local um, data collection, so for instance, the example that I showed in Kenya, where we have soil moisture sensors that were, uh, you know, that were installed locally, that were read out locally. So there were actually people going into the field, you know, taking the records. It wasn't like, you know, uh, put in the cloud and we were in behind our computers here, uh, accessing the data and analyzing that. No, there were people on the ground that were taking the, the readings, that were interpreting the readings. And then, you know, as a grace to us, they were also sharing the data with us so we could, you know, do some analysis with it. With it. But uh, I think the important thing is that if you do ask people to uh, collect data, that it's not going to be a black box and it's going to be data that's also relevant for them that they can utilize and maybe also learn from and see, oh, but if it goes below a certain level, then I need to do something and that we can also help them making those kind of responses based on you know our uh, models and analysis, but that the data actually brings an added value to the person who is collecting the data uh, rather than it just being, you know, there will be, you know, our local field uh, uh, observer or field managers that collect data for us and, you know, we take it away and, uh, and, and we do uh, with the data whatever we want to do, but that it actually becomes an integral part of how they manage the system and that it has a value for their management. So I think that is very important if you talk about citizen science. Okay. Well, thanks. That's very interesting. Um, there are a number of things in the Q&A, uh, which are more focused questions, and I do see that there are three people online who have raised their hands. Um, I can't see who those people are. For some reason, I just see three raised hands. But if we can, I'd invite those people to um, ask, a, ask a question in person. It's quite nice to get a bit of involvement in that way. Now, I don't know how the technology works. So I'm uh, going to ask the the support team to to open the mic and video yes, of Graham. one of the three people who have their hands raised. Let me let me support you here. I have uh, unmuted Ivan Rodriguez, um, okay. but this person now needs to unmute uh, himself. To be able so, to Ivan speak. Rodriguez, if you can go ahead and ask your question and unmute yourself, and then the the panelists can respond.
Okay, that doesn't seem to be working, Nadine. Perhaps we should try someone else. This person needs to unmute, so I ask to unmute. And then Takele, can you please come forward and ask Are a question? You? Who have you invited to come forward? Takele Teshome. Takele, are you there? Mm. Yeah, that does not seem to be working. Uh, third time lucky, perhaps. Who's your third? Uh, the third person with their hand up. Okay, that is uh, Risham Lalpudel is um, allowed to talk. Rashem, Risham, sorry Rishan. for the question, asked to unmute. Are you with us and can ask your question? Emily, yeah, I'm speaking for the Everest. Uh, little party for the crop. I don't need the limit. Right. What was the well, Rishan? It looks like third time was not so lucky because we we heard you briefly and now you seem to have disappeared. Um, perhaps then you should ask your question in the Q and A. Um, okay, so um, we had 20 minutes for the q and a and we now are at that time though i see we still have a little bit of time left in the session violet it looked like you wanted to say something so let me ask you to respond yeah because i'm seeing there's a, a in the chat and also in the q and a there's a discussion about just data collection is only one aspect but even how do you store the data how you then you know ensure the, the credibility of that data even going forward requires resources and certain institutional capacities and that is one of the challenges we have like like in our countries who will store that data who will ensure that the next person who's collecting that data is doing it correctly and all that and that's that's one area where personally I'm not to be quoted but I feel like our academic institutions have really let us down because if universities could take up like uh, um, regular data collection where they have you know students coming in every year and they could then have the professors ensuring the quality of the data and they could store it because most of these are public institutions they are public universities so that it is accessible but Currently, the situation is our universities treat data like it's proprietary rights to them, and it's difficult to access even when they collect data, even for the communities. So I think, as somebody is saying, data collection and even citizen science needs to be accompanied by a lot of advocacy, because there needs to be an advocacy about getting these in instruments for, for communities to know which are the good instruments that they can use. And they may be able to even get financing, but if they don't know what is the right instrument, they will not. And getting that information from academic institutions is like pulling teeth. So I think there's an attitude change that we all need to get towards data, towards science and its role in society. I think maybe we need to have like a crusade where we go preaching to people the importance of using data to improve our collective lives, which currently there are some gaps. And I agree with the people putting things in the chat. Okay. Thanks, Violet. Uh, Claire or Malus, do you want to comment on that at all? 
No, I think that's very relevant, but also who's like the, the owner of the data and how do you ensure, um, you know, the, the ownership, but also uh, if there's um, specific information, you know, locality. I mean, you you have data and it is linked to a certain location. So how does that then reflect if you make that open uh, available? How does it reflect on, you know, the person who, you know, owns that piece of land in terms of, for instance, water uh, consumption, you know, does now the, uh, I don't know, the, the water, uh, the the, uh, the Ministry of Water come and bill you because you have, you know, uh, used a certain amount of water. So how does that then work? In, and is there uh, private information uh, also included in that? And, and yeah, really, who owns the data and, and how you deal with that? I think that's very important. Yeah. There, do you want to comment at all? No. Um I just want to reiterate that knowledge and data in the humanitarian sector is something that can be quite problematic because there's a high turnover of staff and data gets lost and knowledge gets lost from projects and programs because they're quite short as well. So there's one of those, there's that issue there with programming and projects in the humanitarian sector. Um, and also in the humanitarian sector, there's quite an interesting thing where quite often they collect a lot of data, but they don't do a lot with it. Um, so collect data collection for the sake of data collection mm. is something that I've definitely seen, which is quite an interesting issue. Mm. Um, just Thanks. to add to the discussion. Okay. So what I'm going to do just to, to wrap this up is just ask each of the panelists to respond very quickly to one question I'm going to ask, and then we'll uh, uh, move on to Fariana to, to do a, a summary as the rapporteur. So the topic today was technology. Um, well, technology for impact was our topic. Okay, we've talked about data, we've talked about citizen science, we've talked about some aspects of technology, which each of you have, have introduced. So I want to come back to this issue of technology for impact and perhaps ask three of you, is um, technology exclusive or inclusive? And where? Do, how do we make it inclusive? Violet. Yeah, I don't. I think technology is like a knife. It's neither inclusive nor exclusive. It is the user of the knife who decides how they use it. And mm -hmm. currently, the scientists have actually made technology exclusive. They made it difficult for 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 if you're not even if you're a scientist in another sector, trying to get information in a different sector is very difficult to get. So. I think it's yeah. I don't know whether that answers, but it is not the technology. Technology you can you can take like a, a tablet to a, a lady in the village who has really doesn't have much formal education, but she's able to punch punch around, and her grandson or granddaughter shows her, and within no time they're somewhere chap chap. Within no time they're using their iPad, they are they are they are, they are talking with their friends and and all that. So technology is is a tool that we need to demystify and we need to get in the hands of more people. Okay, thank you. I like the knife analogy. Uh, Marluce or Claire? I personally think it's to do with uh, the approach that it's set in and how it's developed. And that really, um, really then leads to whether it's inclusive or exclusive. Exclusive. So it's to do with how you have kind of inclusive, uh, kind of participatory designs and approaches. And in terms of tool development, it's having a clear idea of who the tools are being developed for and developing them with those people and who the outputs being developed for and develop it with them. So it's working with people rather than in isolation and embedding things you do within the context that you you want them to be, or you, yeah, it's to do with embedding within communities and developing with people, Yeah, I think. Yeah, and associated with that, I guess, is breaking down some of those barriers to access and, yeah. Malus. Yeah, no, I think it, it can be, 
but it doesn't necessarily is. So it, it can, for instance, have with these, this vapor data, which is big data, enormous amount of uh, information, um, but how do you process it, make it you know, into bite-sized chunks of information that people can understand and, and, and utilize? I think that's where the power is. But then the question is, who makes that translation from the big data to those chunk-sized images, chunk-sized data information structures, and do they charge uh, a cost for it? Uh, and do we actually make uh, those those junk site information? Are they uh, responsive to the local need? And and what you know what what kind of information is needed, or is it just some information, random information that is interesting but is not really relevant? So I think it it can be, but only if you use it in a way that can uh, help making it more inclusive. So I think that's also one of our main uh, challenge in the, in the next phase of the project. How do we make it inclusive uh, compared to you know what we've done in the first phase, which is, you know, still a bit exclusive and a bit high level uh, analysis that we've done. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much to our three panelists. Um, I think we've had some uh, three very interesting presentations and some uh, very useful and insightful comments to the questions that have been raised. There will still be uh, opportunity for all three panelists to type directly the answers in the Q&A session to the questions addressed to them. So now let me hand over to Fiona as our rapporteur to give us a summary of our session today. Thanks, Jane. Um, Thank you. Um, Thank you, Graham. It's, um, it, the session was really, really engaging, uh, especially uh, I, I'd like to thank uh, moderator. As moderator, you have moderated it very well. So in, in sometimes joining a seminar or workshop online, it, it's sometimes like, okay, maybe I can just switch on the Zoom or the platform and then I should do something else. But all four of you didn't uh, get the, um, that chance to um, be away from the discussion. So thank you very much. It was very uh, engaging for me. And uh, being an outsider of those projects, I was listening very closely. And as the topic chosen, technology for impact. So uh, I had a very, uh, being an entrepreneur, especially in Bangladesh, especially working in the sanitation sector. So what was very intriguing for me, like we recently have introduced uh, a technology platform uh, to for the decision making process and also to reach our customer also to serve them really well also to know their feedback and also uh, to hear them so i was hearing all of your uh, approaches i mean um, and also i really agreed with the notion or the gap that has the technology or the scientist or the people who are uh, academician, the people who are working in the ground or the user level. So there is still a divide, especially in the context like us, like Bangladesh or um, Kenya or Nigeria or some other places. So still we don't have enough data or the data is that already have, we don't have access. So we can't take the right decisions and we don't know how to uh, make the right decisions because we, th those things are not available. And also in some cases, those are not affordable. So when I see the approaches that Marlus mentioned, like they were trying to adopt uh, their tools that can be used for uh, the people who are really in the ground, I mean, especially the farmers for the irrigation, I mean, how they will manage their water, that will be really helpful. Otherwise, scientists will do their researches and um, the farmers, they don't even know their languages, you know? So that needs to be done. And thank you very much to all of you because you are doing this. Um, and for Violet, you are very, um, energetic about what you were saying to uh, reduce that gap about science or citizen science and what you whatever the term we can say sometimes it's 
uh, but as a field worker, it sometimes we don't understand it. it it's it's the buzzword sustainability, uh, resilience, or it's citizen science or participatory approach or whatever it is. But we need to understand the people, what they really need, and how we can um, how tools can be used for those people. And Claire, I was really really happy to see because it's from Bangladesh and also to know about the failures and how you are working here and improving um, your method, your approaches to make it more clear and uh, make it more grounded. So that's what I feel. And I will be very happy to learn more about the projects that have just started um, what would be the outcome? I would be very happy to learn more of them. So thank you, all of you. Thank you, Fayana, for your summary. Thanks very much to our presenters and to the audience. I think the Q&A kept, uh, kept uh, the presenters on their toes, and I see they still have some questions to answer, and a nice chat that has uh, been going on in the chat box too. So thank you very much for your participation, everyone. And uh, let me now hand over or hand back to Nadine to wrap up the day. Thanks very much, Graham. Uh, very engaging, uh, very interesting session. We are here uh, in the back end. We're as a technical persons. We're in the same room. We have also been uh, engaging with the discussions very much. Uh, of course, you couldn't hear us, fortunately. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Uh, Graham, Farana, Marluz, Claire, Violet, very interesting. Thanks for joining us. I'm sure this is going to continue uh, in the homes, in the universities, in the offices of people. Uh, they take something home. It was very insightful. Um, yeah, what more can I say? This is the end of uh, day one, and I think uh, it was great. I'm looking very much forward to day two which will start with a session on diversity for impacts. And I'm, I'm sure that's also going to be very interesting. So hope to see all of you there and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.